Hello, my name is Cam Johar. Welcome to the Cam Johar Show. My guest today is a very dear friend of mine who I've known for probably about 20 years. He's a practicing solicitor and runs his own business. Very, very interesting, deals with mental health cases, but he also finds time to do charitable work, not only here in Leicester, but also in India, in Jalandhar. So very, very interesting story that uh, we've got to bring for you today. So without further ado, my dear friend, Ranjit Thaliwal. Welcome, Ranjit. Thank you very much, Cam. Thanks for the opportunity of, uh, of coming onto your show and, uh, and speaking about a few things that we get up to in terms of day-to-day -day stuff. Good, welcome. So tell me a little bit about personal stuff. So you're a family man, you're married. I am. I'm married, two children, wife, Serena, um, Harbinder and Gurpreet, um, our two children. Based in Leicester, born in Leicester, mm -hmm. Leicester lad uh, back in 1966, mm -hmm. uh, back in the day. Um, I'm a lawyer, mental health law specialist, so it's an unusual area. We represent those who are detained under the Mental Health Act. There's okay. a phrase called sectioned. Yes. That you might have heard. So where somebody has a, a mental health problems where they're risked in terms of their health, the, the safety of others, um, their own safety, there is the power to bring them into hospital by force. Okay. And, and that is the phrase sectioned. And if you're taken to hospital by force, then you're allowed to have a court hearing to try to get discharged. So people that have been sectioned, and our audience will be familiar with that yes. uh, word. Yes. So there's numerous reasons for, for an individual to be sectioned. What, what would some of those be? Well, it classically it would be a, a situation where there may be an incident where they try to harm themselves, you know, for example, an overdose. They may be behaving in a way which is deemed that they've got a mental disorder and they may not be caring for themselves. There can be a number of different examples, um, but it gets to the stage where I suppose ultimately it's felt they're not safe to be out in the community and then that forcible steps taken to bring them into a psychiatric unit by, by force in effect. And when that happens, it's because it's quite an extreme thing. Sure. There must be the right to appeal and challenge that. And that's what we do. The court effectively comes to the hospital. Mm -hmm. We have a hearing and we obviously support them in trying to get discharged. Okay, so as an individual, if a, an in, if a person is sectioned, and held, are they held against their will? What actually happens? Yeah, it's, I mean, if you were sectioned, uh, you can stay in hospital voluntarily. Mm -hmm. That's the way you can sit. So if a person has insight, they understand they need to come in, they could do that. Where they're not willing to do that, then compulsion is used, and that's the phrase sectioned. And if you're sectioned, then in effect, you haven't been brought in against your will. Okay. Uh, and you cannot simply depart. And then your legal right is to have what's called a mental health review tribunal, mm -hmm. where you have a judge a senior psychiatrist and lay member, three members of the panel, and effectively it's argued out okay. whether they're detainable or not detainable. Okay, so those individuals that want to challenge those decisions uh, would come to a firm such as yours yes. and employ you to represent them, be their legal representative, yeah? Exactly. So exactly. tell me some about some of the cases, I mean obviously you can't talk about individuals, especially with our own community. Yeah, I mean, one thing that mental health has, mental health problems, unfortunately, they have no boundaries, mm -hmm. so they don't respect anything in terms of age. So we represent an adolescent who may be 12, 13 years old, right to, through to an elder who might be in their 90s. Uh, demographically, it has no boundaries. You can represent somebody who's um, hasn't got much funds, right through to somebody who's very affluent indeed. And again, the point about communities is right across the board. Talking specifically, I suppose, about the Asian community, um, there are clearly people who are detained from, from the Asian background. The, the mm -hmm. reasons can be numerous, can be varied. Um, uh, sometimes, unfortunately, people have a mental disorder which is going to last for some years. And, sure. Um, they can become what's called a revolving door patient, where you get multiple admissions, and it may be because they have a breakdown, they don't comply with medication, etc. So. Um, certainly the Asian community, as, as per all communities, uh, has that problem. The figures for Asian communities are pretty much, I think, in line okay. with, the, with mainstream community about the number of detentions. So we're not, uh, as, as a member of the BAME community, we're not more likely to, to have mental disorders than anybody else? By and large, no, the tensions aren't higher. Okay. Um, I think the, the, the saddest uh, figure is around um, suicides, mm -hmm. in particular male suicides, and this is a generic figure across the board, you know. Um, it, it is um, three times higher for males th than, than females. Okay. It's in excess of 6,000 sort of deaths a year. Right. And, and it's one of the 
biggest killers of males in the sort of age group of late 20s to mid 40s. Yeah, it's a sad fact of our life. I, 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 I fail to understand it. Yes. Why our young men in particular? And 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 are those figures any different for for the Asian community to, to the to the host communities? I'm not. I don't know what the full breakdown is. I don't think there's a, a massive difference. I think one of the biggest problems around that, and this is why there's been quite a lot of. Um, campaigns around males about talking about stuff mm -hmm. uh, males are not so good about talking yes when that problem arises and, uh, and there's obviously been various campaigns out there national campaigns just to get people to talk uh, because by talking then it, it obviously pre prevents this sort of disaster happening mm. you know which is obviously the ultimate consequence if somebody loses their life um, I'm always shocked because you know we lived in live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world but we have over a hundred men a week Mm. committing suicide, taking yeah. their own lives, thinking that there's, this is the end, there's nothing else, yeah. that nobody can help me. Yes. Do you think, um, you know, we touched on it, do you think a lot of that's to do with the whole idea that men in particular seem to think that there's a weakness if they discuss their emotional issues? I think there may be an element of, uh, you know, machismo around that, the fact that the, this sort of man-up type scenario, mm -hmm. and I think that's what people are trying to break down through these campaigns, that it's not a sign of weakness to share, to seek help, etc. I think I think that has been, I think, an issue in the past. I mean, allied to that is generally the, the matter of stigma. Mm -hmm. Mental health still has stigma out there. Sure. And again, that prevents maybe some people sharing uh, the issue. But without doubt, awareness is important, and that, that can link into sport, mm -hmm. and that can then link into the, the journey back to, to being well, basically. Sure. If you think that the emotional and, and the stigma is being broken down, why do you think it is that still it seems to be younger men that are committing suicide on, on the whole, rather than, because to me, it would feel that an older guy, mm more set in their ways, yes. you know, a generation or two older than the, the guys that are actually doing the, committing the suicide. Why mm. do you think that it's, it's the younger guys that are doing that, more of it? It's a really interesting question. I suspect there isn't probably a, an, easy, an easy answer. There may be multiple layers behind that. I think um, life events tend to be behind mm -hmm. um, many issues, you know, whether that be a bereavement, um, loss of work, loss of self-esteem etc sometimes these should illicit drugs is not a good combination at all with mental health that's that's a negative so i think it's probably a, a variety of reasons uh, but then of course that pressure point for it to get to a suicide um would, would clearly not happen mm. if the problem was shared sure because then the help and the sport and the statutory services are out there there's multiple sport levels that that can be given, for example, the clients we represent when they're discharged, they may be subject to multiple visitations, you know, a community psychiatric nurse, social worker, outpatients to see a psychiatrist. So these are all statutory services. Uh, but of course, they only kick in if the person has that conversation. Yeah, um, but it seems that when you try and actually access services, they're not as easy to find as one would think, even in this information age. It can be, I think, the entry level to all services is via the GP. You know, sometimes it's not so easy to get to see your GP. Not these days. It's, it can be difficult. COVID has obviously created mm. new, new difficulties, new problems. Uh, and I think if you're the first time you've presented as well, and if you had a past breakdown and you're documented and you have a history, then you'd have a team perhaps there. But when it's the first time, that's perhaps more difficult. I mean, actually, not people, not everyone knows, but even A and E there is a triage section, for example, yeah. unless so that can triage you if you have a mental health issue. So it's just having that knowledge, I suppose. So if anybody is, is, is feels that they're in that kind of position, that, uh, you know, that they need some help, the first point of contact would be their GP? Absolutely. GP could be definitely the first point of contact. And obviously on a, on a more informal note, there's brilliant organisations, including a branch in Leicester for the Samaritans, people mm -hmm. who have that moment at any time of the day. Uh, we did some work with Leicester Samaritans and uh, they are taking calls from all over the country in Leicester. Yes. As per the other branches, it's 24-7, it's free. So there's a lot of good agencies out there. Sure. So, you know, people shouldn't feel alone no. and shouldn't feel that there's nobody out there to help them. Absolutely. So there's both voluntary and government organisations that, mm. that are funded by the government, obviously, that are out there to help. 
Definitely. And, and you, you know, if you're not in a situation where there's sport around you, they're there. Otherwise, the first port of call is share it with the nearest and dearest that are around you. Mm. And they can help you in that process. But not everybody has a sport networks, perhaps. It's a shame, isn't it, that there's a little bit of a breakdown in that situation. How has, um, you know, we've, we've had COVID now for a number of months. Yes. Um, have those cases risen in terms of, you know, what you're seeing for people that are sectioned? We are, we've remained busy okay. and uh, our work's remained constant. It's moved to uh, video hearings as opposed to live hearings to yes. obviously deal with the social distancing. It's been a different experience for the patients as well because classically when you're detained, um, you work towards getting time out from the ward. Mm -hmm. It's called leave. Right. So even though you're on section, the doctor can grant you one hour, two hours, four hours leave and get out. But COVID has presented problems because with the risk of infection, etc., um, a leave was very, very tight, and it wasn't getting granted to prevent infection coming back to the ward. Sure. So it's brought some unusual challenges out. Visitors haven't been allowed, you know, so they'd miss the chance of seeing their family, chance of going out. So I think the detention experience has, I would say, been tougher yes. during COVID for those who who are under section. Uh, because you, you need those outlets of, of going out and seeing your family. So, so during um, the, the time as an individual is sectioned, mm. there are degrees of what they can and can't do, are there? There are. When you're sectioned, you're detained, and your doctor is, is a psychiatrist, totally is a responsible clinician. They have the power to um, uh, extend leave, give you freedom. And classically, the way it works is if you're detained and you're settled, you may start by getting half an hour on the grounds with a member of staff. A walk in the grounds, classically in Leicester, that's the Bradgate unit. Uh -huh. That might extend to an hour by yourself, two hours. It can then build up to being a day, can be overnight. So when you're getting well, you can still be on section and perhaps be allowed to go in for three nights okay. as part of that testing process to say that they're getting better and they're simulating. And doctors quite like that as well because it's, it means they can see how they've managed when they've been out and are they taking the meds, etc. So, yeah, you can be on section but still have time off the ward. Okay, so if, if we've got families out there who feel that they've got an individual member yes. that's got mental health issues, yes. so sectioning or reporting that individual, it actually leads to helping them and getting treatment and then if they need to be separated from the family for a short amount of time, it would actually benefit them, wouldn't it? Well, it's, it's very difficult for relatives. They obviously don't want to cause a scenario where perhaps mm. they're their nearest and dearest are detained. And it doesn't have to happen like that because what can happen is if, you, if help is asked for early, A, it may be managed in a community setting mm -hmm. because that help can come to you in the home, preventing hospitalisation altogether. The second one is they may go in without going on section and go in voluntarily. Again, that's a preferable state sure. of affairs. And the third one, of course, is if, if they're not willing to cooperate, is the section. So there's other, there's other scenarios. Okay. There's other scenarios. So there's varying shades there is. Of, of what can be done. Because, yes. of course, the problem with having mental health issues is that the victim doesn't usually know that they're suffering from something. It is, and that's sort of the phrase insight. Mm -hmm. Insight is raised, and insight is about a person understanding what their problems are. Now, someone who's insightful and says yeah, I acknowledge I've had a mental health breakdown, is going to accept the help and probably come in voluntarily. The person who hasn't got the insight is one where there'll be a difficulty and then the authorities may feel compulsion is the only way. Sure, yeah. but that can only be highlighted by a family member or a friend if, if that individual is unaware. Absolutely. And so you're doing a service to that member of your family or your, or your relative by bringing it to the attention of the authorities. And clearly, if you feel that person's in a hazardous mm. state, you know, if something dramatic and terrible could happen, there's a duty, they'll feel a duty to do that. Um, sure. And that's, uh, that's often challenging for, as I said, close family. And sometimes the people who are living in isolation don't have really family around them. It could even be, um, you know, visitors and neighbours who pick up on that. Okay. Um, so not everyone has the strong support networks around them. Yeah. So let's move on to now the work that you do with these individuals. Yeah. So they, they hire your firm to represent them. Yes. Um, and what do they usually want to do? Do they want to just come out of the, in, in, back into the community, be free? Yeah, I mean, it's not a, um, 
great thing to be section. You sure. Know, you've lost your liberty. Uh, and um, the journey of being in hospital often changes the person a bit as well because they'll say, you know, after a period of time they may be very unsettled at the start and then they might start to become settled. Their ultimate objective is normally to go back to their home. Their home could be a home of their own, their home could be a home with family. On occasion, home is a problem. They may not have a home. Sure. And there may be some help needed required finding the kind of right place for them. There's certain clients who won't do well in independent accommodation and then the authorities will source for them supported or semi-supported accommodation mm -hmm. so supported accommodation is a residential home where you have 24 7 care yeah and then semi-supported is where perhaps there might be a warden so so from the detention can be positives in that you can get out hopefully in a stronger position because the whole point is you want to break that cycle you don't want to come into hospital and go in again mm -hmm. you want to come out and stay out um so yeah Many clients do embrace that okay. and work with that. Great. So a very specialist area of law. Yes. So what led you into that? Yes, that's a really interesting question, actually. And, and I have to have to explain what I do quite a lot of the time because it's so, so niche. Um, but I think I, I did a little bit of this when I was just finishing as a trainee solicitor. My principal sent me off to a couple of clients. And I thought it was really interesting, the area of law. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm sort of... Hopefully a good listener. I think that's what you need to be in this area of law. You have to be patient to not sort of be dislodged. You have to put that person at ease. Mm -hmm. And I think those skill sets were important. And perhaps, I think when I started my own firm, uh, me and my secretary, you know, circa you know, nearly 20 years ago, some did think it was a strange decision. How will you manage your practice just doing mental health law? Will you have the work? But I think, as you can see, mental health has become such a big issue now. Sure and a lot more knowledge has grown, a lot more awareness has grown. grown. So yeah, I think uh, I think it was a good choice and certainly I enjoy doing the work. It's, uh, I do enjoy this area of work. And do you see um, this issue and your work um, growing? I think it's going to remain an important matter, an important issue. The areas of growth are going to change. At the moment, the elderly is a factor because we have all time sort of high figures around yeah, Alzheimer's and dementia, we've got an aging population. By definition, I think we're going to get more um, people needing help in that sector, so that's the elder sector. Um, in the younger sectors, again, with young people, I think illicit drugs is in the equation, can be a difficulty. I think even new things like the rise of social media mm -hmm. and the impact upon self esteem and that Instagram photograph. <laughs> needing to be perfect mm. is a, perhaps a new genre of, of, of difficulties that, that arise and uh, and now with COVID it has always been the case with when there's been economic downturn yes. or pressure and clearly COVID's caused a lot of stress per se anyway I think that might have a have a, a factor going forward it already is isn't it I think yeah so you know COVID's obviously been a very stressful situation mm. for a lot of us but going forward, it now looks like where well, we're technically in a re recession already. Yes. So there could be a, a huge downturn in the economy. Yes. And that, of course, brings um, more pressure and, and those of us that are more vulnerable yes. um, to, to lead to more mental uh, health issues. Absolutely. And I think it goes back to that life event point again. Mm -hmm. Major life event, a bereavement, you know, marital separation, um, illness and financial hardship, uh, amongst other things, can can trigger enforcing mental health issues. So I think the, I think even the government are alert to that. They're already looking at that, what may happen. And, uh, and I think the next 12 months will be, it will be a challenge, I sure. think. Ranjit, before we end on, on that particular subject, so, you know, if we've got listeners who've got relatives, acquaintances that may have some mental health issues, what I, advice would you give them? Well, I think they, there's a couple of important factors. I mean. Um, there's good uh, mental health charities out there. A lot of them have a regional presence, mm -hmm. national brands like Mind, Rethink, etc. Um, there's also local advocacy services which provide softer advice uh, and they're around the mental health area. If it's a legal issue, then clearly you can seek assistance. Um, there's our firm is Thalo and Vegas Solicitors. I'll, I'll take a small plug. Thalo and Vegas Solicitors were in Leicester and and taking an informal call is no problem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, seek it. There's many advisors around. Make a call. That could be the person themselves, okay. or it could be uh, their family member taking the call. There's also services that provide support for carers, which could be 
a wife, a husband, etc. Mm. Um, so making the call is of no harm at all. It's sure. worth doing. And and obviously, you know, if people are either reporting themselves yes. uh, or or a, an acquaintance, friend, relative, family member, yes. there's a stigma attached to that, isn't yes. there? So what would you say? You know, how how can somebody put that to one side? That you know, can we just park that over there somewhere yes. and deal with the issue? What what advice would you give to to, to those? I've, I think there's been a really good journey of enlightenment. It's a lot better now than perhaps it was a, t a decade ago. Sure, um, you know, there's a lot more understanding out there, a lot more empathy. Of course, it's difficult, um, and I think the way to to think about it is whether it's yourself or the person who's close to you is that they're in a difficult place, and it's the way of getting out of that. Uh, I suppose. There's a classic mind post, it's a really interesting mind post to go into the 70s, it's got a bloke sitting on a chair in his house and the strap land underneath says that when I broke my leg everyone came to see me and he's surrounded by people. And then it's the same post, the same bloke saying that when I had depression nobody called and he's mm -hmm. sitting by himself. So it's, it encapsulates that really. So uh, again, that's another good point that when you have some, ha it's being in somebody's corner, isn't it? So yes. when they have that problem, you yourself reach out to them, mm. make that call drop the text, WhatsApp, etc. You can do it subtly, and that, I think, would give that person a lot of comfort. Yes. It's not actually always doing something, it's the offer. Yes. To do something that gives them a lot of, a, a lot of comfort. Yeah, I think, because if you were having these issues, mm. it'd be a very lonely time in your life. Absolutely. And just to have somebody reach out to you. Absolutely. Would be incredible that you just know that you're not alone. Definitely. And I think, again, with the hospital side, that's why COVID's been hard. I mean, the kind of things that people turn to, perhaps when they're detained, is family's going to be ever so important, mm. couldn't see family. Sometimes, for example, the uh, the religious aspect's really important, you know, turning to prayer, etc. That would be difficult as well. So um, the outlets have been curtailed. But I think, touch wood, that's getting better now. Yes, yes. Well, mm. let's hope that uh, we continue um, progressing from that. Absolutely. Okay, so Rajiv, one of the things that is very, very interesting about what you do, because yes. we have a lot of people in our community, particularly, that run their own businesses. And we, we're generally uh, people that run small businesses. Yes. You know, whether it be legal practices or, you know, more mainstream shop type retail, yeah. retail outlets. Yes. But, you know, a lot of my friends, and, and it'll be the same for you, are so busy running their businesses mm. and so busy in their families and their social life that they actually have very little time to do anything other than that. Yes. But the interesting thing about what you do is you give a lot of your time, uh, and with, along with your wife, yes. uh, to other, other areas. So one of the things I wanted to, to talk about is this really interesting home in Jalandhar for um, uh, young girls, yes. babies. Yes. So uh, I'll hand over to you because I, I find it fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, I think the first thing is, as you said quite rightly, whatever we do in all our platforms is myself and my wife Rina. We we do it together, and uh, that was um, obviously one of the one of the one of the things that happened almost a decade ago, actually. So our um, original villages are in District Jalandhar, mm -hmm. both mine and my wife's, and uh, we want to do. We did quite a good event here for a mental health charity um, as one of our first events. We thought this was quite good, it was quite successful. Let's reach out and do something in India. We were really impressed. We went to Unique Home okay. itself. It's basically a home in Jalanda which looks after abandoned baby girls. Okay. Did you did you go specifically to to the home to Unique Home or did you come across it somehow? We heard good things about it mm -hmm. on the grapevine and then we thought well this is something we need to we need to go. And effectually originally our respective mums went and had a look at the place mm -hmm. and, and then we got the feedback and went from there so yeah there was it had a good uh, a good name about it and, and that's what sparked our interest um, and then obviously went and saw it ourselves which is important okay so what kind of work have you guys been doing because it's been a decade now yeah but I think the important thing about you can it, it is slightly linked to the issue of the prominent India of female infanticide and you know, baby girls tragically being discarded and this home has a you know, it is quite a compelling picture of it basically a bank type safe deposit box mm. built into its wall so then allows people who are thinking to discard their the baby girls to leave the baby girl there leave, and then the home looks after that girl from that point onwards so yeah. it's it's got a section which is for for toddlers and then it looks after the children the girls right up to adulthood into higher education a very strong ethos to higher education to for them to achieve as much as they can the original home which has been in place for 
since early 1993, I think, is it was very cramped. It was really cramped, and they got a new site. It was a battle to complete this new site, sure. both financially and other senses, and that's completed, and it's a fantastic new site. Uh, it's on the Nakoda Road near a place called Wonderland, which is like a, a sort of play park in yes. Canada. Uh, that's sort of the landmark and it's a brilliant site um so for our journey then i think i'm really the starting point was to register as uk friends of unique home okay so we are um, a registered uk charity the idea is we raise awareness and funds for the home but we are not the home sure to make that clear they have their own governance etc um and that's been a really really good journey and uh, one of the powerful things behind it has been the social media awareness Sure. Uh, we started a Facebook, which now I think has nearly 12,000 followers. And that has been really instrumental, because from that we've done uh, multiple charity, charity events. Now people just go and do things off their own volition. Mm. Somebody will do a skydive and we'll receive the funds. So, Fantastic. So awareness has been really, really important. Anyone with a, a Punjab connection, we've always encouraged them to go. Mm. To take that one hour out in between... Um, shopping and the like <laughs> and when you visit and, and if your family's there then that's great it's uh, they're amenable to visits um uh, and i think awareness has been really powerful we've got also myself and wife of trustees we've got through the trustees interesting of there was a gentleman called tom harrigan mm -hmm. ex inspector of strathclyde police he the punjab police and the strathclyde police had an exchange program okay and he got to know the home I think in the early 1990s, and he is our so elder trustee now, wow. and he's been there from the get-go. So um, you know, we continue to, to do that work, but awareness has been really important. Okay. Yeah. And Bibi Prakash Gore, she's the sort of iconic um, the figurehead, figurehead right? leading yeah. in Econ, yeah. and, uh, and and now actually she's getting a lot of recognition in wards in India, mm -hmm. um, and, and again, she doesn't seek it, she's a very modest person, mm -hmm. but the the awards and awareness, of course, help drive support. Of course. It's been good. Randy, we, we often have these kind of organisations with, yes. with a, a, a real, a, you know, charismatic uh, figurehead. Yes. So is there a succession plan? Because nobody lasts forever, right? A very good point, Cameron, a really good point, that is. Because, yeah, but clearly she's such a, you know, tour de force, mm. such a powerful person that has to be there. She's got other people. There's a, a trustee board there. Uh, there's a lady called Alka who's uh, almost like a right hand lady. There's a senior trustee called Satnam. What they're trying to do, and I won't, I can't be absolutely clear of the total plan, but two or three of the senior girls are in higher education, very, very capable indeed. Okay. And I think they'll play an important part mm. for the future of the home because, in a sense, it'll be a, an older sister yeah. looking after a younger sister. Mm. Um, and one of the lovely things there, which we'll probably understand in our culture, is that. Um, we went to the home once and one of the older girls who'd got married came back to the home with her kids on a stay. Right. Because it was effectively the, it's the equivalent of going back to your home. Because mm. that, that was her home. So it's really interesting uh, to see that. But no, you're right, it's a really important point mm. for the future um, you know, the longevity of the home. Yeah, because, you know, as a community, we have problems with succession planning. Yes. And, uh, you know, the management skills are not always there. No. And, and I always think that an idea like that with such a charismatic figurehead yes. can just, you know, just wither away yes. when, when she's not around. No, I think people are conscious of that. They use professionals in the appropriate fashion, you know, to the professionals around them. They've got a very good, obviously, name in Punjab, which obviously they garner a lot of local sport as well. Yes. International sports there, but sport from the backyard is really important. So yeah, I think um, there is a team there. Good. Um, and I think the future is um, is, is solid. Great. How many girls do, are there? In There's over 60 girls there of the differing ages. I so said, what, what they do is the equivalent of the Indian uni Punjab universities, when they get older, they will send them out to university. Mm -hmm. Obviously one story that came out, which we did put up, we, it was confidential at the time, but one of the girls at uni came, came and studied at an English university and graduated with first class honours. Wow. And uh, that was approximately three years ago. Mm -hmm. So you can see what a fantastic achievement that is. But again, that cements the ethos of the home, that the girls maximise their potential. Sure, how did that come about? Was it from some kind of sponsorship that somebody did? Yeah, I mean, the home dealt with the logistics and, and obviously dealt with the usual channels to get permission, etc. And I think it was just that opportunity to, to graduate with a with obviously a UK university degree, which hopefully presumably was, 
hold her in good stead for her future career. Of course. I mean, they want the girls to be in all the professions that you can think of and, and whatever they're interested in to, to support that. So yeah, it's a really good story. And those stories continue now with, with other girls. Fantastic. So what, what's the future for, for, for that centre? I think the home will continue. It's really good. They've built it in a future-proof way. Mm -hmm. It has things like solar panels, uh, really open areas for the girls, you know, dormitory areas, areas they can teach, lovely grounds, beautiful mm -hmm. grounds with, with appropriate areas to play in grass. So I think the, the idea is to, is to consolidate it, um, to uh, continue focusing on education. I mean, the school run in the morning is almost like a military exercise, if you can imagine, taking that many girls to potentially different schools. Mm. And I've seen it a couple of times where, you know, minibuses are dotting off in different directions. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just building upon what, what's happened. But I, I certainly think education is a really important theme of for Unique Home, and that remains bright. OK. Any, any plans to expand out? Because obviously 60 girls is not even a drop in the ocean of what's going on in Yeah, India. I think they'll receive, obviously, anyone who comes forward. Um, I think we had some aspirations of a, 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 maybe an annex, but I think that's still a work in progress. But it's been so hard to get into this home mm. because of the last the difficulties in the end phase I think they're just really happy now to be there and enjoy the home so uh, um, yeah it, it looks really positive going forward Brilliant. any um, studies any numbers on the number of girls that are abandoned the, in, in the Punjab the, their figures are high I couldn't quote you off the top but the figures are high and I think that's the other thing that's a really good point they there's some sort of terrible posters that, that have been there in the past about you know checking the sex of the child before they're born and yes. things you can do which is obviously very very uh, you know unpleasant mm. uh, and, and and difficult and um, what I think Unique Home has also done is given that message out that you don't have to do that mm. with your baby girls there's another way um, and I think that maybe maybe that can be a, I think that's been a side role message that's come out it's given that message that look that this doesn't have to happen and it's a bit of a beacon of light I think mm. Unique Home um, but yeah, and I think uh, it's a it's a historical reasons why this, this things happen. Sure. Um, and I think you'll know from the UK views is 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 is, is different. Those, yes. Those views don't stay here in terms of the girl boy situation. I think that I think that uh, we'd like to think it was different, yes. wouldn't we? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And and the problem is for for our communities and others around the world that yes. prefer a, a, you know a, a, a boy over a girl or yes. the other way around yes. is that science hasn't actually helped has it no. in determining before the, the birth because yes. of, of course I, I i guess that the abortion rates are going up and up and up yes. uh, in various parts of the world and i think with with that's been part of the issue people have been sort of obviously trying to um affect that process haven't mm, they? And, yes. and that's been the difficulty um but like i said i think it's been a really positive message of unique home that Good. that's there and uh, and, uh, and i think it's its name is is certainly becoming well 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 known now okay. so what kind of support are you guys looking for for that home yeah well we try to um we have a really good range of supporters. A lot go personally, um, a lot visit, a lot have been going even without UK friends. Yes. You know, it's acted as a catalyst. You don't, um, so uh, we had a major event range just before COVID. Uh, you know, it was all set as a dinner dance in Birmingham at the Regency. That got postponed. And we'll be resetting that in 2021, I think, if I'm honest, when government guidelines allow. We'll still have space for people to come. So I'd probably say keep an eye out on our social media platforms. Uh, and look out for that event but also generally just spread the word and tell people to sync up mm. and join our platforms because from that becomes awareness we found the awareness was important the, the funds came from that yes it was not the other way around yeah. uh, and also yourselves through your family through your network and also your connections in Punjab tell them about the home because of course people who are living in that district or an hour away they've got the, the, the chance to visit as well. So sure. just pass on the word. That's a great message for us. Absolutely. Um, is there any way, because I, I know there's programmes where you can actually sponsor a child and yeah. their education. Do you guys run anything like that? The homes think looking at those options. We stayed away from the individual route. Mm -hmm. And what we've tended to do is give our money uh, the donations for the strategic next thing. And most of that's been around the build, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and costs. Um, I think one of the things that they were sensitive about was, for example, you know, 
one girl getting sport and the other's not. Um, so I think the nicer way to do it, and people have done this in the past, is um, if you go to them, you can sometimes take what they need at that time. Sure. You know, we a long time ago, me and Rina, we went on a trip and we had a fantastic time. We took them to Wonderland ourselves. And that was just a lovely thing where all the girls came in a bus, etc. And we had the afternoon there. But I think people in the past have gone and got them on McDonald's and etc. Yes. etc. Et just the kind of things that kids enjoy. It's a treat, isn't it? Yeah. Kids enjoy. So, um, yeah. And also, you can always speak to Bibi. Bibi will also, if you go to India, you can always say to her, well, what do you need at the moment? And sure. she might say, you need a particular item. You might need exercise books. And you can get that. So, Fantastic. Um, whatever, whatever you can do, be gratefully received. That's brilliant. So if that wasn't enough mm. of, of charity work <laughs> and running your own business and, and having a family, you do more, don't you? We've done a few things. I mean, uh, I think we obviously we've got this thing we have to do, save our was, yeah. and service. That's part of our community. That's part it? of our community. Yes. And, uh, and we've managed to support a few different things. Again, it's always myself and my wife, Rina, the kids are involved, our family's involved. Our friends are involved, our network's involved. And I think that's been part of it, if I'm honest. We're very blessed that I can send a message out on WhatsApp to 20 people and I can get a response quite quickly on something. Mm. And that's the thing, Cam, as you said quite rightly, people are busy in their lives and the hurly-burly running around and some people don't want to be the organisers of an event. Yes. And perhaps have leading an event, but they want to support an event. Mm hmm and they do it that way, so yes. it's, it's that dynamic that not everyone wants to bring it from the start, but they want to be part of the journey. Sure. And we're blessed in that regard. But yes, we have supported the charities, and um, so one, of the, one of the new ones that have come forward in the last couple of years, again, myself and wife have really enjoyed is Midlands Longer Saver Society. That's it. Uh, so tell us more about that. Yeah, well, they're a brilliant organisation established uh, about seven years ago, uh, by Randir and Bramjeet based in Warsaw. Yeah. They effectively um, do a lot of things, but the main thing is that they serve food to those in need. Yes. In, in, a, in, in a simplistic way to explain it. They've got locations in the UK, I think, close to 25. Yes. And obviously we are part of the Leicester team, and Touchwood is a brilliant set of people. Leicester, as an example, and this is the same all over the country, Leicester served on the Leicester market um, five times a week. Yes. In the evening, people would queue and get a hot meal, uh, and uh, and the serving was for about an hour. Post COVID, it became a challenge because of the market was closed. Yes. And people dispersed into housing, etc. So during the pandemic, Leicester, as an example, have been serving to people at homes, and done over seventy thousand meals. Wow. Which has been really, really good. But yeah, we we really enjoy the Seva with the uh, MLS Leicester and. Um, and they do fantastic work all over the country. And it's on that very simple um, premise of serving food, serving humanity, um, and we really enjoy it. It's really positive. Okay. Do you, you guys still need more support? Because the problem is with, with somebody like um, the Middle and Lungar City of our service, yeah. it's a very well-known organi organization. Yes. And somebody may think these guys are all done, that they don't need any help. Do you guys still need more help, more people, more volunteers? Oh, definitely. Uh, help on all fronts is welcome. So if you want to be a volunteer, you can... Uh, that's been a bit more difficult during COVID because they've kept the teams compact. Of course. But that will change, I'm sure, over the next phase. So you can volunteer, that's number one. There's always the need for funds. Uh, there's the, And one of the other things they need is food. Mm -hmm. And Leicester, for example, is working on you know getting some more accommodation to store food. And, and corporates and individuals will donate items. Classically, in a, in a meal box, there's a hot meal, a, a bottle of water, a piece of food, a packet of crisps, mm -hmm. and sometimes a sweet item. So an individual can come and donate. You can also take a server. Mm -hmm. For example, in Leicester, we serve seven days a week. And you know, a personal organization could take the Saturday server. So I'll do the hot meal. And you can do it as a family. You can do it as an organization more recently. Um, literally a couple of weeks ago, um, Sandia Foods took the saver. Yes, I saw that. And they prepared that. Yes. So corporates can come forward, but a family can come forward. Mm. My sister had a, a nephew's birthday and she did that. So there's so, so many ways to help. Sure. Uh, so perhaps controversially, um, Reggie, you yes. know, I can do seva and do Langarat the Godwara. Yes. So why would I come and, and, and do that with, with Midlands Langarat Seva rather than go to my local Godwara and, and do Langarat oh. there? 
Both are obviously fine. Here, the, 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 the MLS effectively goes out to those in need. It has that element of remote option to it. Mm -hmm. So some of their outreach in the, in the market days, you'd have your anything from 90 to 120 in the queue. But then a couple of teams would go out with bags to the rough sleepers. Yes. So in a sense, you're taking the food to them. It also became part of the uh, timetable, I suppose, because those in need know those services are on. And, and the people that are in the queue are from many backgrounds, not mm. always the backgrounds you'd expect either. Sure. Um, so I think there's a place for both. Okay. But undoubtedly, um, the need for the MLS service is undoubtedly there. Um, and there again, as an aside, they've also done some international platforms. Yes. So it's beyond, beyond the UK as well. The other interesting thing, of course, is 25 places it covers, there's many places it doesn't. And you could, um, if you lived in a location that hasn't got one, you could come forward and, with the obviously support of it headquarters, create start a your city. Own. Exactly. Yes. Like you could do a you could do a hub. Yes. You could do a service, and and I know certainly um, HQ are very very up for supporting that and and backing it, and that would increase the number of locations. Yes. Um, so those of us thinking that you know, does it replace what we're doing at the Gordwara? It obviously doesn't. No. Um, the audience, for want of a better word, is very different. It is. Um, because, you know, um, we've obviously touched on mental health, yes. but the health of our own community sometimes um, is, is an issue. Yes. Um, and certainly that, um, you know, when you go to the Gurdwara, there aren't that many people that actually need to be fed. Yes, I think um, obviously the God has got the, the spiritual need to go yes. and, uh, and the community feeling. There are obviously people who come to the God who know it's a place of service where food will always be available. Mm. But here the queue is, um, I think because we're going to them. Yes. So that's the difference. And uh, and they also have, with Leicester recently got a brand new van. Um, MLS HQ has a, 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 an excellent um, coach. Yes. So that again, that helps to do the outreach service. Of course. Where you can go out to a certain place and do a do a, a sort of a mass a feeding session. Yeah. Um, but it's a great one. Like so our, our role in this has been very recent. As an aside, I can mention, which is a, a great honour, really, just in the last few days, I was approached to get involved with the committee, and I've you know gratefully received that. So yeah, I'm, I'm sort of proud to be part of that. But certainly, just in terms of service and charitable, it's a real service that me and Rina enjoy. Yeah. And the kids enjoy it. We, something we really enjoy. Okay. So now you're part of the organisation. Yes. Right. Where do you see it going? I think for me, because I'm a newbie, I'll be learning on that one okay. and, and supporting those. There's, there's some two fantastic people, many of people, fantastic people in Leicester, but there's a, a Jindan Raj who do a lot of work in Leicester, Raj, another Raj who leads one of the feeds. And to me, I just want to support them in the Leicester sure. entity. I think probably one thing I'll try to reach out is the corporate angle mm -hmm. for MLS nationally, because there's so much goodwill towards MLS. Yes. If corporates can come forward, um, do a feed, maybe accept them as a charity of the year, these wins will be quite powerful. Yes. Um, and we've had some good corporate sport in Leicester. Great. Um, and obviously corporates sometimes do that as part of their responsibility. Yes. As part of their role. So individuals are always important, uh, but corporates will be important as well. Fantastic. So big, bright future? Oh, definitely. I think it's, well, what they've achieved is just amazing. And like I said, with, I've just jumped on it relatively recently. We have. Sure. So we can just be part of that. and. And sport, like I said, it's the uh, the atmosphere of the feeds, the atmosphere with the people is really good. And one of the things you do, when, for example, in Classic on a Tuesday feed, when we come back at seven to eight, we did it in the winter. And when you come back home and you're sitting at home and perhaps have your meal, you realised uh, and reaffirmed, you know, how blessed you are. Oh God, yes. In terms of how we're living, when mm. you see you know, the difficulties that other people are facing. I think that's really important. Yes. Yeah. It's really important. So, Ranji, you know, um, everybody talks about how busy they are. Mm. So you've got these three clear areas of that you're involved in. Yes. Um, running your own business, as I said, is never easy. No. And then obviously, you know, you have a family. Yes. You have an extended family like everybody else. How do you balance it all? Well, I think, again, going back to the thing, we're doing it as a family. So uh, me and Rina will be doing the stuff, the kids and the family involved. I mean, the dinner dance that we're having, for example, our family would attend. So it helps to blend the two together, isn't it, really? I okay. Think, I think that's one, one important factor. Um, I think it's snatching those moments. I'm a bit of um, a perennial on my phone, which uh, you know, which is uh, I'm always locked to it. But then, well, I try to use little pockets of time. Sure. So you know, something like if I'm waiting for a hearing to start, 
you know, I can send the same message to 10 people uh, if I'm chasing something. An example is the unique home event needed sponsors. You know, I'd send what the sponsor would get to 10 people and they'll start responding. You try to use that downtime quite well. Sure. Downtime. And, the, and enjoy it. Yes. We enjoy it. I think it's hard to do it when you don't enjoy it. We enjoy it. It has its own reward in, in multiple levels. So no criticism. People are busy. Everyone's busy. And uh, I think the, the shout out is this, isn't it? Do what you can. Yes. In what model you do it, in what style you do it is up to you. Mm. It may be giving money. It may be opening a door. It may be hands on. It may be creating something. Just do what you wanted to do, do, do something. Yes. And, and I think everyone does something. Yes. So, you, you know, you know, very professional, mm. you know, in, in, in the business that you do. And then on the other side of that, you see people, obviously, in your queues when you're, when you're doing yes. Langarseva yeah. and when you go to Jalandar. Yes. You know, does it make you much, much more grateful for the position that you're in? Oh, definitely. I mean, mental uh, doing being a mental health lawyer already gives you that anyway, mm. because you have got the empathy. You find people in difficult positions uh, with these issues of, of not having food. That's that's problematic. It does. It um, it uh, reaffirms that you're um, blessed. You know, you've got um, a lot of things that other people haven't got. Mm. Helps you to appreciate those things. I think there's a phrase I can't quote where it came from, but uh, somebody said that what you do for charity is the rent you pay f to live on planet Earth. Yeah, wonderful. So there's a good phrase that, you know, yes. so we all got a duty to keep up our rent. Yes. You know, and uh, and as you know, financially as well, s a pound for somebody is a big donation. Mm. A hundred pound for somebody is not a very big donation. Yes. It's all relative. Mm. It's all in context with that person. So, you know, you you can never do too little, whatever you do. It's, it's really, really good. It's not about the amounts. You know, mm. It's it's just doing something, isn't it? Yeah. Do you think that, uh, again, coming back to business, mm. as a one-dimensional business person or business family, there's a lot of stresses involved in yeah. that. Does it, the, the charity, the work, work that you do, does that help you in, in your actual business in terms of, you know, relieving some of the stresses and strains of running a business? Well, I think uh, A, it has its own reward. So mm. even with the firm, you know, uh, my partner, he's fully committed to the, the charitable causes as well. We have a, like a, a responsibility personally on the corporate side as, as well to do that. So I think it has its own enjoyment. Um, it, it isn't perhaps as challenging sometimes as you think. It has, has it waves. You have times sure. when you're doing a lot of work around an event. There's an intensity. And then there's times where it's a little bit more relaxing. Unicom is an example. Obviously, to start that from the get-go and register as a UK charity, um, Involved a lot of work at the beginning. Yes. But now, standing at 12,000 followers, you know, money coming through different portals, the home being in its new accommodation, uh, the journey is is a lot more progressed. You know, so as usually, when something's in its in its start phase, you've got to put more in. Yes. And then the momentum goes. And of course, there's team effort, like all everything we do. Um, there's trustees, there's supporters, there's our there's the my WhatsApp people, you know, there's 10, 20 I can WhatsApp and they never say no. Yes. And I'm blessed. I've got to make sure I don't ask too much. Otherwise, they'll change, they'll change their telephone number and not tell me <laughs> what the number is. So it's that balance, but I try to yeah. balance it out. There's people, they're just great. And they do it all um, usually just on the quiet. Yes. I don't yeah. know who they are and not all of them seeking any you know, shout out. Well, that's the interesting part, doesn't it? It mm. takes all sorts of people. And it as is. you said, there are those that want to lead yes. and those that want to just come and serve yes. and, and not be noticed. Yes. Um, yes. So there's roles for everybody in, in volunteering, isn't there? Absolutely, absolutely. I'll go back to myself at work, I'm not perhaps we mentioned, but we always try to raise awareness on mental health. It's what we do. And we've done an annual event in mental health going back nearly sort of seven years. Okay. And we do an annual event and it's always at the city rooms. There's always sort of 150 people, and we've supported causes like Samaritans. There's an advocacy group in Leicester called LAMP. And one of the nice achievements was what the Trust was creating a room called a sanctuary room mm -hmm. in, in the psychiatric unit, which had various things to relax people, you know, lighting, etc. And we did that a few years ago, and that raised enough money for that room to be created. So again, I think that with mental health, we try to support smaller initiatives. And I think they've all been appreciated because that's how that's what we do. 
So I try to keep it. I think for that reason, we're quite well known in mental health. Fantastic. So Ranjit, you know, in summary, yeah. uh, what does the future hold? Five years, 10 years? I think the future holds is uh, maintaining what we're doing now. I mm-hmm. think myself and we know we're happy with all the things that we're involved in work, continue the things we do. My, you know, my partner's committed to causes. He's, he's a trustee of the food bank, mm-hmm. which he's got involved in. It's maintaining what we do. I think with, as, as time will go by in the next few years, I might be able to recalibrate my work to do less and uh, in addition to hopefully going on a few holidays, I'll be able to keep that time and input into the charitable causes. Yes. Oh, always open to something new. Sure. You know, something else happens. So we try to do a mixture. As you know, we've got the international with Unique Home, Healing Little Hearts. We had an event for them. They're a great international charity. And we try to do local as well. Yeah. Um, and with the events, for example, some of the events, they're obviously quite good fun as well. And people like that. There's a mixture of things. It's maintaining really what we've got. Yeah. Continuing to support it and uh, and pass out, pass on what we've learned. Great. Perhaps to others. Yeah. Do you ever see a time when you know the the law practice takes a back seat and you you concentrate on your charitable work? I think it'll be it'll be a slower journey. I would see myself working for a while, but maybe maybe grade back over the next you know two or three years. So I think it'll. It'll always be a bit of both. The nice, the wonderful things about Unique Home is obviously we can visit it. Yes. And there's a great joy from visiting it. So it becomes both. We can go for a holiday, but we go and visit the home. That's that's really, really good. Um, and likewise with the other charities, it's actually being there, MLS being there, and, and, and actually at the feeds, that's really enjoyable. Mental health, obviously, uh, sporting the others who are out there. So, yeah, I think it's just, it's just uh, more of the same. But we have to give thanks, A, for obviously the lives of lead, but obviously to all the people that support us. And that's important to me because they're the ones who, who are there, who, who back us at all of these events, who do the direct debits, who um, confidentially help. Mm. They're, they're, they're really our strength you know, in terms of um, the projection that we get for, the, for the causes. So um, for our listeners, what's the Facebook group called for? UK Friends of Unique Home. Okay. UK Friends of Unique Home. You'll find that. You'll find that. The powerful one is Facebook. Yeah. Also on Twitter. Okay. On, on Instagram, etc. There's a website. Yeah. UK Friends of Unique Home. You can go on that. Brilliant. You just put UK Friends of Unique Home. It'll come up and that platforms are linked on with that. So that's what we've got to Unique Home. Even anyone wanting to visit, the address details are there. Okay. So you can then know where to go. Fantastic. Et you can contact us at our office. Yeah. If anyone wants. Do you to. ever organise trips to to the to the home? We don't do it directly. It tends to be blended into people's own um, recreational trips. Okay. Um, so people will go for heritage reasons to visit family, and and then they normally go on the back of that. I mean, like I said, if you need to want to go, then you can come via the office. Thankfully and and positively, Unique Home itself has developed its own portals now, and we've. Try, we've been okay. pleased about that now. So Unicom itself has got its own website, has its own, got its own social media, and somebody behind it at the moment is doing some fantastic work. So we're starting to share their stuff. Okay. It's one of these problems we had in the early stages. A lot of people thought we were Unicom. Yes, of course. Because our presence was strong. Yes. And we were always saying, look, we're not Unicom, we're UK friends. Um, but yeah, it's out there. You know, please look, sport, pass on the word, and visit when you get the chance. Fantastic. Ranjit, thank you very much. Brilliant, it's been a pleasure. Been really interesting, enlightening, yes. uh, to say the least. So I'd love to have you on again at some point. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cam. Thanks for the opportunity. Anytime. Appreciate Anytime. It. Thank you. So there we have it. A, a, a really unique individual. You know, some of us have businesses and some of us do charitable work, but an individual that's managed to combine all of those things into one, you know, maintaining his family the relationships there, running a very successful law practice and doing an enormous amount of good for others. And I think that really, you know, shows what people's purpose can be. So, you know, we're very fortunate, especially in this country, to have fantastic opportunities and fantastic environment. So if you can reach out, help Ranjit with his work, you can go and uh, volunteer and serve somebody at your local market if Midland Langar Seva is doing the langar there. You can go to your gardwara and help them serve. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes doing that. And of course, we have the home in Jalandar where you could help a, an unwanted, abandoned young girl to realise the potential of, of what is possible in life. So until next time, take care.